Uh, we are going to discuss a number of topics <coughs> as uh, we have done it in the previous occasions. Uh, we start with uh, this uh, uh, thing called or the effect called as the Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. Basically, it is the uh, oscillations in the conductivity or the resistivity in presence of magnetic field uh, of these two dimensional electron gases that we are uh, talking about. Of course, these are name of uh, two people and in fact, uh, there is another effect uh, which is closely related. It is called as a de Haas van Alphen oscillations which is seen in the susceptibility uh, of a magnetic system. Uh, this susceptibility uh, is actually uh, equilibrium property. So, one can use equilibrium um, techniques of statistical mechanics in order to calculate uh, uh, the <coughs> susceptibility and see its oscillation as a function of B or 1 over B that is the magnetic field. Uh, here we are going to talk about conductivity. So, conductivity is uh, uh, is a non equilibrium process because of the reason that you are driving the system. There is a battery connected which uh, sends a longitudinal current and also other reasons uh, um, that for which it is a uh, non equilibrium process. We will just come to that. Now, this uh, is this Shubnikov uh, de Haas oscillations is seen in the, uh, the longitudinal conductivity uh, that is sigma xx. Uh, and um, it has also oscillations and uh, as I uh, have mentioned earlier uh, that a uh, full treatment of this cannot be done at this level uh, because uh, we are not used to or rather exposed to the uh, non-equilibrium uh, this uh, formalism such as uh, uh, talking about the Boltzmann transport equations and so on. I will just show a few steps and of course, we will uh, come back to it when we talk about the Kubo formula and calculation of conductivity from there. Once again, just repeating uh, that Shubnikov de Haas oscillations is the oscillation in the conductivity profile uh, as a function of the magnetic field. Uh, so, what it means is that it is as opposed to the Hall conductivity, it is the magnetoconductivity or the conductivity uh, in the longitudinal direction. So, basically sigma xx or rho xx that shows oscillations. Uh, which we have seen uh, in the if you look at the integer quantum hall uh, plateaus. So, whenever there are plateaus in the hall conductivity uh, these uh, uh, the magnetoconductivities are completely flat and at 0 uh, and whenever uh, the hall conductivity jumps from one uh, plateau to another uh, this one shoots up uh, the sigma xx or the longitudinal conductivity shoots up. Uh, the system undergoes through a series of uh, metal to insulator transitions which is what we have said. Okay. So, uh, we are uh, just some uh, basic steps of uh, non-equilibrium uh, Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, it tells you that uh, the conductivity is obtained. Uh, so, this is the conductivity. It is obtained as uh, sigma. Uh, which is uh, n e square tau over m that is the Drude relation and uh, now we will uh, write it in terms of an integral. So, it is uh, 2 e square over m and uh, one can write it as d 2 k by 2 pi uh, square. So, this is a two dimensional Brillouin zone because we are talking about a uh, two dimensional system. Of course, please do not be confused that we are writing k, but k is not a good quantum number. Uh, I mean not the both the k's are not good quantum numbers uh, in this particular problem. So, we will change it to an energy integral. I am only writing it uh, formula for the conductivity. So, this is equal to some epsilon and then there is tau of epsilon uh, and uh, there is a uh, uh, minus uh, d f d e. Uh, now, you might wonder that why, where are all these things coming from. Uh, this is nothing but the relaxation rate or relaxation time rather, uh, which 
in the non equilibrium uh, problem is uh, an energy dependent quantity. Uh, it is not exactly like uh, the one that we have uh, seen in the Drude formula where uh, tau is the relaxation time and uh, it is a constant for a, a given uh, material. This one is coming from the Fermi distribution function and um, if you uh, sort of look at it uh, that the Fermi distribution function uh, it can be plotted as follows. So, this is f and this is f of epsilon and this is epsilon and this is say uh, for example, mu or epsilon f otherwise it is equal to 1, but uh, at this point uh, there is an infinite discontinuity which can be written as actually like a delta function. So, this is where this uh, thing coming from and this is an energy relaxation time is an energy dependent quantity. Okay. All right. So, the carrier density which is here, so that is obtained from and not to forget that this 2 comes from spin degeneracy. Okay. So, this is spin degeneracy, tau is relaxation time and this uh, is a Fermi distribution function and so on. Uh, so, n uh, can be written as uh, d 2 k uh, 2 pi square and uh, f epsilon g epsilon where g epsilon denotes the density of states. There is only a qualitative description of the problem and uh, of course, your f epsilon is nothing but 1 divided by beta epsilon minus mu plus 1. Uh, that is a Fermi distribution function. Uh, so, this sigma can be written as uh, E square by m that is a conductivity is E square by m and a 0 to infinity and there is a d epsilon g epsilon when I uh, convert this uh, momentum variable to the energy variable I will uh, bring this uh, density of states and uh, minus uh, d f d epsilon and uh, as I said that the minus d f d epsilon is nothing but the uh, a delta function. So, one can put in all these things and can calculate the integral provided one knows what is the dependence uh, of these relaxation time on energy. Okay. And uh, this is important to know and uh, one can actually take into account various uh, effects uh, inside this. Uh, such as scattering etcetera from impurities or from other agencies and so on. So, all these things can be taken into account here in order to uh, obtain the conductivity which has this form in the Boltzmann transport equation. So, this will be made clear when we actually do a calculation of the conductivity. However, we just uh, wanted to leave it at that. So, the features of these the Shubnikov Dehaus oscillation. So, the, the results are that the uh, magnetoconductivity has uh, the oscillation period. oscillation periods uh, which are given by um, epsilon f by h cross omega b uh, where epsilon f is the Fermi energy and h cross omega b is the scale uh, the energy scale from the magnetic problem. Uh, and uh, uh, importantly the amplitude of the oscillation decreases uh, with B uh, in this fashion that it goes as this amplitude goes as sin hyperbolic 
uh, 1 over b. Uh, in fact, it actually goes as like sin hyperbolic uh, some delta over b where uh, delta includes uh, m star which is a, a we can call it as a magnetotransport mass. So, this mass is uh, not the um, effective mass that we have talked about that, that the particle picks up uh, in presence of a band, but this is uh, because of the magnetic field it picks up a, a mass which uh, is different than its bare mass or the cyclotron mass that we have talked about. So, uh, what happens is that uh, physically uh, as uh, the magnetic field increases uh, basically the Landau level sequentially cross uh, the Fermi level. Okay. So, let me uh, remind you of this that uh, you have uh, this as the Landau levels which are equally spaced okay. and uh, these Landau levels are slightly broadened because of the presence of disorder. Okay. So, one way is to uh, at a given value of uh, uh, magnetic field we, you can talk about uh, that the chemical potential is uh, you can uh, uh, assume the chemical potential to be somewhere, but now as you increase the magnetic field suppose you keep the uh, chemical potential here uh, which is also the Fermi energy. So, the let us say the Fermi energy is here and now remember that picture that we have talked about uh, that uh, really there are at the edges of the sample uh, there is an infinite potential discontinuity or there is a sharp discontinuity at the edges. And uh, so, this is the uh, chemical potential and as you are uh, increasing the magnetic field uh, these uh, difference between the successive Landau levels increase. And uh, then uh, these uh, Landau level will first cross the Fermi level okay. and uh, then as you uh, tune the magnetic field to larger and larger values then even this will cross the Fermi level and so on. So, if you uh, at an arbitrary position if you place your Fermi level so that that defines the filling the uh, number of electrons and then you are tuning the magnetic field uh, then the magnetic field uh, will uh, the larger magnetic field will cause larger um, change in the value of uh, the between the two Landau levels and uh, suppose the, mag uh, the uh, chemical potential is placed somewhere in between then it will be sequentially and periodically uh, the uh, Landau levels will cross the Fermi level and that will cause uh, fluctuation in conductivity and how it does that because the conductivity is proportional to the carrier concentration and also it is uh, proportional to the carrier scattering probability. So, it is a carrier density and scattering probability. So, let me write that so conductivity is proportional to 1 carrier concentration or the density of carrier and 2 it uh, also depends on the scattering cross section or scattering probability let us call it as scattering probability that is the electrons uh, scattering into states that are um, unfilled. So, uh, if uh, all the uh, levels the Landau levels are completely filled and the chemical potential or the Fermi energy lies uh, above a uh, few such levels here I have shown two such levels it is above that uh, then of course, uh, there is no uh, where the, uh, the electrons can scatter to because there are no available states. But um, uh, when uh, this uh, the Fermi level let me draw it with another color say the Fermi level is here it is in the inside the Landau level then there are unfilled states which are above this red line uh, that the electrons can scatter into and this gives rise to the non equilibrium situation. So, there are scattering taking place. And uh, if you see that whenever we have talked about uh, the Landau level and the Fermi energy vis a vis the you know the position of the Fermi energy uh, all the time we have uh, specifically talked about that how the Fermi energy uh, is uh, 
placed that is uh, uh, all the I mean a few Landau levels which are below the Fermi uh, energy are completely uh, filled that is the Fermi energy lies above them ok. But it is always not the case uh, where scattering takes place. So, this conductivity uh, will have to you know take into account all of that. So, uh, the density of states at the Fermi level now you understand that who which, which electrons are taking part in this conducting process or this conductivity which contribute to the conductivity. The electrons that are at the Fermi surface they are mostly you know susceptible to the transport properties or taking part or contributing to the transport properties. So, the electrons which are at the Fermi level or just below the Fermi level they are responsible and these uh, so basically uh, how is the density of states uh, at the Fermi level that decides uh, the nature of the conductivity. So, uh, the uh, density of states uh, decide conductivity and the conductivity is proportional to the carrier concentration and the scattering probability. Uh, basically, the periodic fashion in which the Landau levels actually cross the Fermi level uh, that gives rise to the fluctuation in the conductivity and this is called as the Shubnikov de Haas effect SDH in short ok. So, this is called uh, SDH effect and uh, and these oscillations are actually measured in experiments and they uh, the theoretical explanation or the theoretical formalism uh, that are calculated uh, or rather that are uh, you know derived to know the oscillations its um, dependence on uh, the magnetic field or the inverse of it and the temperature etc all of them very nicely corroborate with the experimental results that are obtained. So, we have talked about uh, the Hall conductivity or Hall resistivity. Now, we have talked about the other resistivity or conductivity that is uh, in the longitudinal direction. If you wish you can call this as sigma xx which is uh, called as the magneto conductivity or magneto resistivity by rho xx. and this magneto conductivity shows uh, these oscillations ok. All right. So, let me um, tell you another very important point and that is called the importance of the 2D geometry. We have been talking about that uh, you know these electrons are um, confined in uh, 2D and uh, of course, the energies are quantized in the z direction, but it is mostly uh, residing in 2D and how experimentally we can achieve it I will just talk about it uh, after this. But uh, let us uh, try to understand that uh, there are uh, something special about this 2D geometry at least with regard to the Hall conductivity and the Hall resistivity. Um, to um, understand that let us understand that uh, the resistivity and the conductivity these quantities do not depend upon the geometrical aspects of the sample. That is uh, these are inherent properties of the carriers or the electrons in this case and they are uh, simply uh, not a function of how thick the sample is or how uh, wide the sample is uh, etcetera ok. So, but uh, when someone goes to the lab and tries to uh, measure these quantities they do not measure resistivity and conductivity they measure resistance or conductance. So, how is resistivity related to uh, resistance and how is conductivity related to conductance. Um, if uh, the experimentalists find uh, resistance and the theorists are interested in the fundamental uh, aspect of things that is uh, uh, the resistivity or the conductivity then how do they correlate how they, how do their findings correlate is there a scaling required when uh, uh, an experimentalist uh, give you a result on the resistance of a sample say a 2D electron gas and uh, you as a theorist have some expressions is there a scaling that is required ok. So, that is the question that we want to answer. 
and um, in 3D I am sort of it is like a quasi 2D. Uh, so, this is a sample geometry that we are considering. So, this is a certain thickness and so this thickness let us call it as uh, D. Let us say the length is L and say the width is W. Okay. Uh, so, there is a, a j x being passed here. So, this is your x, this is your y and of course, the z axis is perpendicular to the plane in which direction the magnetic field is applied. So, this is z. Let me shade this portion by a different color. Okay. So, this is um, uh, for this geometry. Uh, the current uh, flows in the uh, x direction uh, basically your j y the y component of the current density equal to 0. And uh, because that is equal to 0 we can write down Ohm's law uh, which tells you that E x and E y that is equal to rho x x rho x y. Uh, minus rho x y and rho x x. It is very important to understand that uh, this is an antisymmetric tensor and this antisymmetric property of the off diagonal elements uh, is purely an artifact of the magnetic field. So, if you do not have a magnetic field uh, this uh, rho x y and rho y x will have the same sign but in presence of a magnetic field they have opposite signs. Okay. So, this is E equal to rho j is what we are writing. So, this is j x and this is equal to 0. So, that tells you that this is equal to a rho x x j x and a rho x y with a minus sign and uh, j x again. Okay. So, this is the Ohm's law. So, uh, we know that rho x x is equal to E x E x by j x and uh, rho x y is equal to minus E y by j x. So, this is the longitudinal resistivity and this is the Hall resistivity. Okay. So, once we know this then the resistance now we have talked about the resistivities and the resistance. So, these are the resistivities and these are resistances and this is equal to R x x which is equal to V x by I x that is the definition of the resistivity uh, for the x x component which is nothing but equal to E x into L, L is the length of the sample and divided by uh, the J into A, A is the area of the phase that is uh, has been shaded in this thing. So, this is the area which is nothing but um, uh, it is equal to the um, the w into uh, uh, d basically w is the width and d is the thickness. Okay. So, this is equal to that and uh, so this is nothing but so this is nothing but the rho x x x x and this v x uh, and this is uh, e x uh, into l and so this is rho x x l by a. Okay. So, this indeed uh, the conductivity or the resistivity resistance rather uh, in the longitudinal direction is uh, related to the resistivity uh, in that direction that is longitudinal direction uh, by these uh, geometrical factor which is L over A. L is the length of the sample and A is the area uh, of that uh, uh, of that phase which I have marked. And similarly R x y 
is minus vy by ix which is equal to minus ey uh, w uh, that is the v and this is equal to j into a. Okay? So, this is equal to rho xy into w by a. Okay? So, you see that uh, in a 3D sample to connect the resistivity and the resistance you need these geometrical factors L by A and uh, W by A. Now, the moment geometrical factors come into the picture, it becomes important uh, to know uh, their exact values and to ask this question, if I change the dimensions, uh, what will happen to the values of the resistance? Uh, the, of course, if you change L by A, uh, and uh, multiply you know say uh, L by a factor of 2 and uh, divide A by a factor of 2 uh, then of course, this ratio goes up by a factor of 4 which means uh, that the Rxx will be 4 times rho xx. Okay? So, they are not the same. So, you need that scaling factor uh, by uh, knowing the uh, dimensions of the sample that you are dealing with and similarly, for this uh, Hall resistance, uh, the, it is connected to the Hall resistivity by this W over A. Again, you know, you can change the ratio and that ratio will determine what exactly is the relationship between them. Now, what happens is that in uh, 2D, so this requires uh, L by A and W by A, which are geometrical quantities. All right, so uh, let us talk about in 2D. Okay. Now, there is something slightly interesting about 2D, which uh, from a very general perspective, let me tell you this that I can write down R equal to uh, rho into 2 minus D. Okay. Uh, that is the resistance and the resistivity are really connected by this uh, thing where D denotes the dimensionality. And uh, if you wish to uh, test this, uh, let us test it from the knowledge that we have acquired uh, in class maybe 8th or so, where uh, we have uh, seen that uh, the resistance of a wire, a cylindrical wire is given by R equal to uh, rho into L by A. I mean, I am just talking about a geometrical sample, where L is the length of the wire and A is the area of cross section. So, it is this kind of a geometry that uh, we usually talk about where A is this area and this length is L and so on. So, this tells you that uh, this has a dimension of length, this has a dimension of length square. So, this actually goes as length to the power uh, rho by length and uh, if you test this, that is in 3 dimension, this is of course, a 3 dimension. So, D equal to 3, R equal to rho by so, the dimension, so it is 2 minus 3, so it is equal to 1. So, there is, there has to be a L here. So, rho into it is uh, 2 minus D. Okay? So, uh, if you put D equal to 2, it becomes rho by L. Okay? Now, this is the point that uh, for D equal to 2, uh, this uh, of course, gives you that there is no um, R is same as rho, uh, but it is not that simple, which is what we are going to point out. Uh, this looks like the 2D is special where R and uh, rho will be uh, just uh, the same thing. So, there is no conflict between a theorist and an experimentalist. Uh, if you want to know the uh, intrinsic property of the material, it is displayed by the resistance that you calculate uh, because your uh, the geometric factor which is L here that cancels out. Let us see that more elaborately. Okay. So, uh, now we talk about a 2D sheet. Okay? So, this has a length L and it has a, say a width W, you can take both of them to be same, does not matter and uh, you have a sheet current which is Jx. So, Jx is the uh, current density in the x direction. Okay? So, uh, we have 
R x x, we have R x x equal to V x over I x uh, equal to E x L divided by J into W, uh, J into W. Uh, so, this is a in uh, I mean multiplication sign and uh, when, when there is a x, I will write it as a curly x like, like the one that I have written here. So, this is nothing but equal to rho x x L over W. Okay. So, uh, there is still uh, the longitudinal part of the resistance uh, is still depends on uh, the geometric parameters by uh, these. So, R x x and rho x x are still dependent on geometry and if you change this ratio R L by W, uh, then uh, the dependency. So, R by rho changes and you need to know that how you have changed the dimensions of the sample in order to answer uh, that what is the relationship between the R and the rho. Let us see for the Hall. So, the Hall resistivity says that it is R x y which is equal to minus V y uh, because minus because of the reason that I have told you this earlier that this is x and this is positive y. So, the, uh, the Hall voltage is in this direction. So, that is why it is a minus V y because that is a minus y direction. So, this is minus y direction. So, this is minus V y divided by I x and this is equal to minus W E y and uh, W j um, basically this j x and this is equal to the W will cancel it is equal to minus E y by j. If you wish you can write a j x here uh, in that case. Uh, so, this is a j x and so on. So, there is a j x, there is a j x and this is nothing but rho x y. So, in 2D, R x y and rho x y are identical. So, the property of the sample is exhibited by the resistance uh, that you uh, calculate uh, in the lab. Okay? So, this is uh, an important thing. Uh, so, they have the same unit. So, there is no geometrical factor that uh, connects uh, one to the other. Okay? So, direct measurement of uh, R x y will lead uh, rho x y. Uh, let us uh, also show this that uh, since we are uh, talking about this, uh, let us say the unit of the Hall resistance. I mean of course, Hall resistance has ohm or uh, you know kilo ohm that we talk about because the H over E square is 25.8 kilo ohm, but let us see that how it comes about uh, in terms of the uh, this uh, length and mass and time and so on and so forth. Okay? So, H over E square is nothing but uh, energy into second, you remember what H is, H has a dimension of angular momentum because that is what Bohr had said that uh, the uh, electrons uh, you know moving in certain chosen orbits would not radiate energy and their angular momentum would be quantized in, in, in unit of h or h cross. Okay? So, that is the that is angular momentum. So, uh, we write it as uh, energy uh, divided by uh, uh, energy into the length. Okay? So, this is equal to really uh, second over length. So, that is time over, um, so this is like time over um, length. And uh, similarly, uh, this uh, R which is V over I that is uh, has a energy over charge that is the uh, so, voltage is potential energy divided by the charge. So, this is energy by charge and this is energy by time because uh, so this is energy by time and this is equal to again energy uh, uh, into second. This is not energy, this is charge, charge by time that is current. So, charge uh, square. So, this is the resistance. Uh, 
uh, and um, if you simplify it then it becomes uh, again equal to where you change um, the energy into second uh, divided by so this charge square will be energy into length and uh, the energy will cancel and it will become again uh, these uh, second which is T and divided by L. Okay. So, that is the uh, unit of all resistance. So, this is uh, rho x y and so on. Okay. So, uh, H over E square has the unit of uh, resistance and um, uh, it is also the unit of resistivity in two dimension. Okay. So, that is uh, one important thing and the conductivity tensor which uh, we call it by G are inverse uh, because these are tensors. So, these are R inverse uh, or you can you, you can write it as R inverse. So, you have to take an inverse of a matrix in order to calculate this. So, for the quantum Hall states of course, the rho x x equal to sigma x x equal to 0. Okay? This is an ambiguity that we have talked about a number of times that uh, this really happens that uh, the longitudinal resistivity vanishes and the longitudinal conductivity vanishes. So, on one hand the system resembles that of a perfect conductor and on the other hand it represents that of a perfect insulator. So, uh, both cannot be together, but it really happens uh, in presence of a magnetic field. So, a minus g x y which is the conductivity uh, or the whole conductivity is equal to 1 over r x y which is equal to 1 over rho x y which is equal to a minus sigma x y. Okay? So, conductivity and the conductance uh, they have the same unit and uh, uh, this is only true for the Hall case. However, the longitudinal case has a this length factor or the dimensions um, associated with it. So, uh, we uh, have been talking about you know uh, two dimensions and so on and then uh, several times we have said that uh, uh, there are electrons are being um, uh, confined into uh, dimensions, but how electrons are made to confine in uh, two dimensions? What are the uh, physical or experimental ways of uh, blocking the electrons into escaping into the third direction or rather confine them in the uh, in a two dimensional plane okay that's what is important so uh, we say that how uh, two dimensional electron gas is formed okay so this is an important thing uh, this is an experimental aspect that one needs to understand that how it is uh, formed. Okay. So, uh, this uh, electrons uh, combined or rather confined into these uh, two dimensions has a long history. I mean this is like uh, mid 60s of the last century that is uh, around 1965-66. The research was at its peak in order to have these electrons confined. Uh, into say two dimensions and so on and to see the uh, quantum effects are more pronounced uh, in, in a more pronounced fashion. Okay. So, since then it is known that the electrons you know accumulated at the surface uh, of a silicon single crystal which can be um, done by uh, inducing a positive uh, gate voltage um, and uh, that forms a 2D electron gas. And uh, you, you already know this that you know if you have uh, an electron in a in a one dimensional box so this is that first quantum mechanics problem that you do so this is 0 to l and a particle is here so this particle is here okay uh, these uh, potentials are going to infinity okay so the particle cannot escape the wave function has to be equal to 0 outside and the reason that the wave function has to vanish is that because the potential is infinity here for the particle then for the 
finiteness of the Schrodinger equation that is what I am saying is that minus h square by 2 m uh, d 2 psi d x 2 plus a v psi it is equal to e psi that is the equation uh, which you solve there is a second order differential linear differential equation called as uh, Schrodinger equation and this which is what you solve and um, if this term goes to infinity which it does uh, for uh, outside the box then this has to be equal to 0. So, for this to be infinity that has to be 0. So, wave function has to be 0 and it has to smoothly match with the boundaries. So, uh, the wave function the boundary condition is that psi at L psi equal to 0 and uh, it has to vanish and then uh, one can find out that for that to happen uh, the k's become quantized uh, which gives you um, n pi over L. So, uh, the k values or uh, this like the in one dimension the momentum of the particle uh, that takes values which are pi over L, 2 pi over L, 3 pi over L and so on and it is for this reason that uh, this is like uh, so this is correct and then this gives you h square uh, n square pi square by 2 m l square where l is the length of the box and this is how the energies are quantized. Now, uh, n equal to 1 will have certain energy, n equal to 2 will have 4 times that energy, n equal to 3 will have 9 times that energy and so on and so forth. Uh, so, this is the quantization that occurs in a usual quantum mechanics uh, mechanical system as soon as you try to confine it. So, there is a confinement induced you know the quantization. There is another quantization that happens in uh, presence of the magnetic field which we have seen as called as a Landau levels. So, there are you know two kinds of quantization that takes place here and uh, these two quantizations put together will give us uh, all these uh, quantization complete quantization picture of the levels ok. QHE uh, or the quantum Hall effect has both these sort of inbuilt uh, with each other. Uh, let me show a experimental setup where the 2D electron gas can be formed. Uh, let me try to draw this. Um, so, it is an experimental setup. Okay. So, this is uh, like a p type silicon which is uh, grounded below and there are uh, you know there are source and there are drains. So, this is uh, so this is the source. These are MOS devices the metal oxide semiconductor ok. I will uh, tell you a very simple picture of that. So, this one uh, then uh, there is a, a drain there. So, so this is the source, this is the drain ok and uh, so there is a, so there is a drain, this is a p type silicon, uh, this is silicon oxide which is a in insulator and there is a uh, region which let me show it by a color. So, this is a region which is a metal. So, there is a metal oxide. So, there is metal here. So, this red is metal. This is an insulator called as an oxide and this is a semiconductor. And that is why it is called as a MOS device metal oxide semiconductor device. You know the, so these MOS structures and uh, uh, there are quantum wells uh, where you confine it again in the z direction and uh, make the electron or the charges flow only in the uh, x y plane that can be done. So, quantum wells and then there are super lattices etcetera which are uh, perfect examples how uh, the 2 D electron gas are formed ok. So, here we have discussed only the MOS structure and uh, a simplified uh, version of the MOS structure can be uh, or rather what happens can be shown here. 
in which so there is a uh, there is a metal uh, at a voltage V0. So, it is attached to a battery so at a voltage V0 and these are the charges being um, accumulated here. This is that uh, oxide layer uh, like a silicon oxide uh, or uh, aluminum oxide and so on which are known these uh, insulating materials and there is a semiconductor. And in presence of such a structure, the energy, the potential energy Vz of the electrons that looks like this, okay. And uh, this is, this value is minus Ev0. So, the, the charges actually accumulate at the uh, boundary of this metal and the oxide, uh, this uh, metal oxide edge. And so, what happens is that uh, in this particular case, when you have um, these, uh, you have a certain source voltage and uh, uh, being applied and uh, there is also a gate voltage here uh, that is here. So, there is a gate voltage here. So, there is a Vg that is applied, uh, the source is of course drained and there is a, a Vd that is applied uh, and uh, Vd is positive. So, this is positive and there is a gate voltage, then the uh, in this region the electrons start flowing between the source and the drain and they cannot escape because of the presence of the semiconductor. So, they make a, a 2D electron gas in this region itself and this is what we know by the 2D electron gas a and this experiment or rather these kind of materials are being subjected to a magnetic field. And, um, and then of course, we see all these Hall effect uh, etcetera. There could be you know a more sort of um, elaborate discussion on this where uh, actually you uh, show the energy band diagrams and uh, how the energy band diagrams uh, with uh, sort of no gate voltage uh, to be flat and then uh, as you apply a gate voltage then how the bands deform at the junctions and, and how the Fermi level crosses etcetera, how electrons get accumulated and that is actually uh, shown in this uh, thing uh, here by this potential. So, this, this is a kind of potential that gets uh, generated for the electrons and that is why the electrons are um, they get confined uh, into two dimensions. Okay. Okay. So, to uh, sort of uh, wrap up the discussion to wind up a whole lot of things that have been said over over the past few days and uh, so there is a sample hall sample or the just a uh, there are these electrons that make orbits okay and uh, they make orbits these are called a cyclotron orbits and remember there are these magnetic field lines that so, they make a center about the magnetic field lines and the magnetic field is large and that is why the cyclotron orbit gets smaller and smaller which you can understand by you know who uh, sort of a, just think of a charged particle with a velocity v uh, and uh, this is uh, being uh, balanced by. So, this goes into a circular orbit which we have shown and this is like a mv square over r. So, uh, you see that uh, B and R are inversely proportional to each other which means if B is large R is small and that is exactly what uh, we see here and there are these dots represents the magnetic flux lines that penetrate the sample. So, these electrons uh, undergo a circular motion uh, about those uh, these uh, points and uh, but that is only the story. Uh, that happens in the bulk at the edges they do not get to complete com oscillations full oscillations and uh, they become more energetic by scattering at the edges okay and they drift because of the magnetic field they drift from one edge to another they actually give rise to conductivity or the resistivity unlike the electrons uh, at the bulk and 
this is the electrons will move in the opposite direction. So, if the electron moves in this direction, then the electrons would move in this direction and uh, uh, this is because of the reason that we have shown that uh, if you simply model it by a simple form of a potential that is V of x and uh, that shows a sharp behavior uh, right at the edges. Uh, then these um, velocities are different in different directions because the velocity, the slope of the potential is different at different ages. And uh, uh, this is called as the electrons undergo a chiral motion. Okay and which, which means that uh, they have uh, different uh, velocities at the different directions and so on. So, th this makes it different uh, the behavior of the bulk to be different than the edges. And that is why uh, they have earned a name called as the topological insulators. And if you ask the question that uh, are these edge modes robust, they indeed are robust because uh, if an electron has to scatter from here, the only possibility that it has to come to one of these states. Now, because of the macroscopic length of the sample, so these uh, the, all the states are full, so they cannot accommodate more electrons. So, if there are no phase space for the scattering to occur and that is why these uh, even I mean disorder and impurities and so on does nothing to that. And these uh, electrons are of course, uh, we know that the energies of the electrons in presence of a magnetic field is shown by this behavior and plus of course, we do not write it, but this is a kz square by 2m where there is a free motion in the z direction, which uh, of course, uh, we are neglecting because this is of no importance to us because electrons are freely moving in the not, not freely, but they are uh, confined in one dimension. But this is if you solve the 3D uh, Schrodinger equation, then this will be there omega b equal to E b over m. And um, for the two dimensional nature, uh, I mean this is the basically the result of two quantization and if you do not have the magnetic field then the energy is uh, the ones that we just talked about that which are functions of kx and ky are like h cross square kx square over 2m. You can put a star here and plus uh, a ky square over uh, 2m star uh, this you can put it a x x and y y and so on, where m alpha beta star which are called as effective mass is nothing but h cross square uh, del square e and del k alpha del k beta and the inverse of it that is the uh, effective mass. And just uh, also to remind you that uh, if you remember that the, how the density of states go. Uh, so, the density of states as a function of energy is important, especially the density of states at the Fermi level. So, dos in 3D, it goes as let us call it as g epsilon, it goes as epsilon to the power half. In 2D, it goes as g epsilon goes as epsilon to the power 0, which means it is a constant and in 1D it goes as g epsilon as epsilon to the power minus half. So, since we are talking about 2D it is important to us which means the density of states is constant which means that there is no uh, it, it is for any value of energy uh, it does not depend upon energy. So, it is just a constant okay. and uh, so this uh, has a value which uh, is uh, one can find out that this is equal to m star by pi h cross square and uh, this gives you the density of states at the uh, I mean uh, at any value of energy basically it is independent of energy. So, this was the quantization before the magnetic field 
after you put the magnetic field there is an additional quantization coming which are called as the um, these Landau levels. The Landau levels are enormously degenerate. The degeneracy is only limited by the value of the magnetic field and the area of the sample. Then we have seen that uh, provided the value of the magnetic field is such that it uh, satisfies certain criteria with regard to the electronic density and the density, I mean this degeneracy. Uh, then uh, one uh, gets a, a freezing of the plateaus, that is the plateau freezes at some h over e square with uh, integer in the denominator. Um, so, it is uh, the rho x y, it happens like h over e square and some n or what we have called earlier as nu when nu equal to 1, 2, 3 etcetera. We have also seen that as soon as you have a plateau in the uh, Hall resistivity, the magneto resistivity or the, uh, the longitudinal resistivity completely vanishes. And uh, today we have also seen that why uh, the magneto resistivity undergoes through uh, fluctuations with certain period that is it, it sort of rises whenever the uh, Hall uh, resistivity changes from one plateau to another, it shows a big jump uh, where the system appears to be like an insulator. And uh, so, this is more or less you know the story uh, that uh, so far has uh, unfolded in front of us about the quantum Hall effect. I look for more uh, details uh, if uh, that is available on these uh, things uh, and uh, else we will uh, sort of uh, go into looking at uh, the quantum Hall effect uh, in uh, lattice systems. We have to understand that how uh, I have notionally introduced this d 2 k 2 pi square when I was writing down the conductivity expression. Uh, now, there in this particular problem in the 2 d electron gas there is absolutely no translational invariance. So, k cannot be uh, talked about as a, a good quantum number overall. Um, uh, this uh, of course, when we solve the Schrodinger one electron Schrodinger equation um, in presence of a magnetic field then of course, one can uh, define k etcetera. But otherwise this 2 d electron gas k is not a good quantum number, uh, but in crystal lattices suppose we talk about a square lattice um, in particular we will talk about uh, graphene which uh, is an important system that has emerged in the last uh, uh, decade or decade and a half and uh, will uh, sort of show that uh, really this uh, quantum Hall effect in graphene gives rise to a lot of new phenomena about uh, graphene and about topological insulators and about uh, uh, various other things. Uh, it will eventually lead to a phenomena called as a uh, spin Hall effect um, which is um, relevant for the discussion of spintronics. Mm -hmm.